Good evening. My name is Natalia Fedorchuk. I am a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We acknowledge the many indigenous peoples that lived with these lands, as well as the thousands of indigenous children forced into the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879 as a part of a federal cultural eradication effort. On behalf of the Clark Forum and the Departments of Spanish and Portuguese Studies, the Center for Sustainability Education, the College Farm, the Food Studies Program, and the Latin American, Latinx, and Caribbean Studies Program, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event. What a long, strange trip, how I awoke to learn my cultural identity in the kitchen. It is well understood that a cultural connection with food is a pillar of social cultural identity for human beings. Research tells us that without cultural eating, belongingness, a fundamental need of human psychology is weakened. This knowledge challenges us to consider whether a lack of cultural cuisine is a threat to the development of our personal identities, and also to think about the undeniable influence that authentic, traditional food has on our connectedness to the people around us. As someone who spent much of their childhood in Eastern Europe, I know that a traditional cultural meal has a significant value in my identity. Pierogi and Vigos, dishes commonly present in my home country of Poland, evoke powerful feelings of cultural belonging every time I see them in the United States. Memories of a childhood in a foreign place have become an integral part of eating these traditional cultural meals. Food is often considered a universal language, and being able to share traditional cuisines with a community or country creates a belongingness and strengthens personal identity. Our speaker tonight, Fernando Serlegui, is an acclaimed author, restaurateur, and consultant. He was born in Cuba and has Basque, Asturian, and Galician roots. His career, as well as personal exploration of his own heritage through regional and national cuisines, has allowed him to connect to his cultural identity. His work across the globe as an author has allowed him to explore his sense of self through a connectedness with his places of heritage and to develop an understanding of the influence that, you, that cultural cuisine can have on our personal identities. Serilegi has opened several restaurants, including one of the first virtual restaurants in Austin. He has also opened two New York Times one-star restaurants in New York City and restaurants in Los Angeles. In 2001, Sarah Lagy served as an executive director of the Texas Hill County Wine and Food Festival in Austin, Texas, the predecessor to the Austin Food Festival. He is the author of the cookbook Our Latin Table and Restaurant Guide Best Eats Havana. Sarah Lagy also consults on several culinary television pilots for both adult and children's networks and is developing a curriculum for culinary executive training program Farm to Business. There will be a question and answer session immediately following the program, so please hold all questions until that time. The Clark Forum welcomes differences of opinion expressed politely, succinctly, and thoughtfully. Disruptive behavior or harassment of the speakers, members of the Dickinson community, or audience members will not be tolerated. As a show of respect for our speakers and everyone in attendance, please stay until the end of the program, including the question and answer session. At this time, I ask you please silence all cell phones and other electronic devices. In the, event, in the event of an emergency, please know that handicap accessible exits are located on the west side of the building. And now please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Fernando Serilegui. Thank you, Natalia, and thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, it's funny, I was gonna say something at, after the first paragraph. And, but, and she said it so beautifully, I was very surprised at um, my last name, which is Sara Legi, Sarah Legi. And so everybody can learn it. We'll do a quick uh, how to learn my name class. And basically think of a woman named Sarah with long legs, Sarah Legi, and you got it. And the full name is actually Sara Legi Goikolea, so a little more Basque. Um, so welcome and thank you. I'd like to thank Mark Aldridge and Dickinson College for inviting me to speak at the Clark Forum. I'm excited to talk to you all today about my awakening, my own cultural and culinary identity through travel and food, and personal exploration of how understanding your own background can create the foundation for tolerance. First things first, while everybody calls me a chef, technically I am, but truth be told, I don't call myself chef. Um, I'm a pretty good bartender and a damn good sandwich maker. 
The French definition for chef is kitchen manager. And I owned restaurants and I've managed my kitchens. I know how to do that and I hired chefs. And in college I worked at a restaurant in Berkeley, California called Chez Panisse with the mother of Farm the Table cooking, Alice Waters. And Alice basically created California cuisine and Farm the Table and never uh, calls herself chef. So if she's not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it either. Um, you can call me Fernando. Uh, there's a great expression in the south of the United States, sort of a low country expression. Uh, when you're simmering or melding a stew, and it, when you just sort of have to sit back once everything's all put together, and let it be on the stove for a while, and it says, uh, now we're gonna let it do. I love that expression. It took me years of personal exploration to discover all the ingredients of my heritage, my Cuban Basque roots, which once I discovered all I had was to let it do. This story is something literal about my identity, but just as often the path showed me the culinary tradition of others and opened my eyes to what I could understand about myself through others. A little, um, a little history about myself. I'm Cuban born with Basque heritage. The Basques are from the north of Spain, south of France an autonomous region, somewhat mountainous terrain, and they are fair complexion, and this is why I don't represent Spanish, Latin, or Latinx. Historically, Basques stuck to themselves. Read, read that as you will. We loved all the different people that have romped through Spain over the millennia, and when the Romans came through, we said, we, as the gatekeepers at the Pyrenees, we pointed south and go, on your way, have a good time, and they did just that. They didn't bother with the Basques. And then later on, you know, a few millennia later, when the Moors came up from the south, we said, stop right there. And um, net net, we Basques hung out with ourselves. Um, and you know, we're, it's a northern climb, so we're, we're a fair people for what it's worth. Um, now it's time for a slide, hang on. I, for I forgot I was doing slides. That's the slide you should have been looking at right now. And this is the next one. Um, the Basques lived in an ecosystem that speaks to the culinary masters they are recognized as today. Hills with everything a cook could wish for, along with glorious pigs eating acorns until they become jamón serrano. Think uh, prosciutto. And living on the Atlantic Cove known as the Bay of Biscay, Biscay, Mark, you, it may, it may be of no surprise that the Basques were fishermen. And because of that, they were also master boat builders. Historically, their catch of choice was cod. And they chased these poor fish relentlessly, and they still do. They went up the west of Europe, across the North Atlantic, and in Newfoundland. And they, many people say that perhaps the Basque were the, were the first Europeans to discover the New World. But the Basque never told anybody, because a good fisherman does not give up his secrets. Um, slide time. That, believe it or not, is my mom and dad at their wedding in Havana. And um, I'm actually gonna backtrack a smidge and you read a quote that I wrote about my mom, which I thought was kind of cute, from my second book. And it, um, it says, to my brave and beautiful and generously loving mother who held me in her arms as we left our home in Cuba, so many years ago, and then held my hand upon our return. And she's just been a great mom. As a matter of fact, when I leave Dickinson, I'm going to Miami to move her. So she's still, she's 90 years old. She's very much still part of her life, still totally together. She's fantastic. Um, so where did I start? Where am I from? Well, I was born in Cuba in the revolution's earliest days. When Fidel came into Havana, it was 19, January 1st, 1959, and I was born July 1st, 1959. Now, he wasn't dressed like that, but he once he, once he was in control, he definitely indulged himself, and he was a baseball fan. So he actually created the team named after his revolutionary group, which are called the Barbulos, because they, wore, they had beards. And uh, that's where that picture came from, just by way of explanation. Um, boom. That's my, pass my Cuban passport from old Cuba when I was just a baby. Now, this is all backstory and an important detail because I'm kind of the embodiment of Cuban and Basque diaspora. Both groups had US laws in their favor. 
Basque having come from the American West for the gold rush and, and falling back on sheep herding. Doesn't make sense to me either. And I refrain from any sheep herding jokes, okay? With, with manpower shortage caused by World War II, the U.S. Congress passed a series of sheep herder laws. Again, no jokes. Conferring permanent resident status on those very same Basque shepherds. Cubans, on the other hand, were welcomed as political refugees right away in 1959. And in 1966, walked to the front of the immigration green card line because of President Lyndon Johnson signed in the Cuban Adjustment Act. I know Cuban Adjustment Act, sheep herder law, like who writes this stuff? You know, I don't get it. <laughs> the, we ended up, we settled in New York, and that's me in the, in the yellow circle. And that's our first five, two more kids were born in the States. I grew up in a big family, eventually seven of us. To get us all fed, it took a pretty big effort. Uh, with a mix of Spanish tradition and with seven kids, also good old American convenience food. Arroz con pollo, frijoles negro, natilla, which is a Latino uh, vanilla custard, or, and to tell you the truth at the time, it was my preference, <laughs> hamburger helper, spam, and jello, and not just any jello, we were always served jello one, two, three, the fancy stuff. Um, we ate at 5.30 and my parents always ate at nine. I can't blame them, it was part tradition and part the kids are either asleep, doing homework, essentially a moment to themselves. My parents had pretty raucous dinner parties full of Cubans or family, which I guess thinking about it were more Cubans. And I remember all we had, we all had to kiss every guest as they walked in our house, male or female, or at least that's how they identified to this six year old boy. At that age, I really didn't know it was any different than any other household in New York. A Spanish tradition passed on from Cuba and now Westchester. While our home was certainly Cuban, I had no feeling of being any different from any part of my community in a dominantly white Protestant Bronxville, New York. Uh, and I truly felt this way my whole life. No door has ever been closed to me. So uh, I've never been marginalized in any way, and obviously that's because of representing white. Uh, even though I have a name like Fernando Saraleggi, you think they might, you know, think twice. Um, also, this kind of weird, it's kind of weird, I never knew that there was a personal history or culture when I was in Bronxville um, to embrace, but that was a, about to abruptly change. I was about to interact with my culture in a big way. That's also, that's me and my brother. After graduating from parochial school, first grade in New York, my parents made the announcement. We're moving to Florida to Key Biscayne. To be very specific, an island just south of Miami, the, ver um, the same Key Biscayne Bay referenced in Steely Dan's Dr. Wu from Katie Lied with the lyric, Biscayne Bay where Cuban gentlemen sleep all day. But I digress, or do I? By the way, that song was playing on your way in tonight. I was in it for a culture shock. Steely Dan were correct. Key Biscayne was 75% Cuban, and the lingua franca of the island was Spanish. I wasn't in Kansas anymore. Church was front and center. We were all altar boys. I had my first Holy Communion and my first kiss. I know, a bit young and not very altar boy-like, so I apologize. Uh, the kissing of my parents' friends hit new high. The one sandwich shop in town only sold Cuban sandwiches. No more grinders, no more heroes, no more subs. It was not easy for this eight-year-old Cuban boy. On the other hand, we were seven kids now. Two sibs born in New York. My brother older than me and my sister younger than me formed the tight-knit tribe. And we didn't leave a stone unturned on that island. If we weren't at the beach every day, fishing, snorkeling, hunting, the reefs for anything that was alive, especially lobsters, my mom's favorite. We were running that island from our Schwinn stingrays, terrorizing fiddler crabs in the mangroves, learning to sail, and how to work a spear gun. We were six, seven, and nine years old, and our parents gave us a spear gun to go into the ocean with. It's just a very, very different time. And I like to call them our jungle book years. In full war paint regalia, my young self was kind of confused. Key Biscayne was an alternate universe, 
And according to everything I'd learned in my home in New York, the Saraleggies were not quite as unique as I thought. Suddenly, our whole community was homogenous, Cuban. Every house we went to used the terms like merienda, Spanish word for snack, mid-afternoon snack, get you over to dinner. And more kissing hellos and goodbyes, crucifixions in every room, but it was one big family, that island, and I liked it. You know, it worked for me. And then it happened. By some parental opportunity, there was an edict, and after three years of delightful childhood mayhem, we were going back to New York, back to Bronxville, back to the wasp town that I knew wasn't our ethnic community anymore. A big help was that we were seven, so we had each other. And I don't want to dramatize this too much because we slipped right back into it. But, now, but I now know that while we were known and represented white to others, I knew we were different. And to be honest, it was pretty cool. This is scary. Um, and this is going to be part of what I'm about to talk about. But basically, I went to Louisiana. And I worked as a, as a, uh, on cargo and supply boats for oil rigs. And so that's my Siemens card. Um, and you'll see, and the story co is coming up behind it, but that I was born in Cuba, and I go from New York, and that my position, once again, no jokes, was Seaman Wiper. Pretty impressive. And one of the crazier decisions of my life, I had overheard the host at a post-high school summer house dinner party bragging about how much money he had made offshore working on oil rigs. I had taken the year off to make some money to go to college. We were seven. We all paid our own way to, through school. Um, the next thing I knew, I was in Morgan City, Louisiana, the same Morgan City that was just recently devastated by Hurricane Ida. To say this place was a place, while steeped in Cajun culture, a backwater is a gross understatement. Another, another culture shock for me. My mom, let her, my mom later let me know that she thought she would never see me again. And to that, I've always thought, you might have wanted to tell me that. <laughs> my baptism was harsh, starting with the heat and essentially signing away my autonomy. I was, I was a fish out of water. But hey, sometimes that's a good thing, right? Having to beg and plead to get what's known as Siemens papers, and it gets worse, I was granted a Merchant Mariner's card, my possession, my position, ordinary seaman wiper. Again, no jokes. From the moment of my first deployment, I was in for a shock, many shocks, really. My first captain on a 65-foot boat with a crew of five saw my seaman's card and noted that I was from New York and I was Cuban-born. And he promptly got the crew together and said, hey, boys, looky here. We got ourselves a commie Yankee. Well, that was nothing. I mean, I was officially afraid then. I was like, what, what have I done? I'm, well, that was nothing. It gets worse. Storms, 12-foot seas, sliding one-ton metal boxes on the back deck, drunk and high captains, putting me in the control room with a compass point to steer to overnight after three hours of sleep and a 12-hour day, being dropped into the hull to stack two-inch thick anchor chain in a storm, and as you went up and down the waves, the chain would come in and out. And as you stacked it, if your finger got caught in between links, you lost the finger. There was and nobody cared. There, everybody there, had, were, their bodies were just marred by the job. It was that dangerous. All that said, it isn't a fraction of how horrified my state was. I do look back with fond memories, though. I was taught a lot. I learned how not to die in the high seas, in the middle of the Gulf not let sliding metal supply lockers push me off the boat into the storm into oblivion, and a few cool rope knots as well, which I still use today. But most important, I suddenly understood that cultures could be found within the US. I was in control of my own destiny, and I've never forgotten that. It's been a touchstone. Louisiana might as well have been another country, and their English, well, it wasn't. Seem they seemed entrenched in their community identity, and that was Cajun. They were Acadian fur trappers who had been sent to Louisiana at the time when Louisiana was French, from Canada, and Canada was French, and have a deep love of their own unique culture. And at its epicenter was food. Every cargo and supply boat had a crew of five and to eight sailors, depending on the size of the boat. 
one member that everyone respected on every boat I worked on was the cook. And it wasn't about getting fed, it was about getting fed right, feeding their cultural identity. Red beans and rice, gumbo, jambalaya, and so much more. All new to me. My two respites during this odyssey were sleep and meals. I realized slowly that their jambalaya was my arroz con pollo, their gumbo is my paella, and that red beans, you guessed it, were frijoles negro, black beans. I saw how th their food was their identity and realized that I hadn't even noticed my own. I had survived, and underneath it all, I had thrived. I learned one can learn about self from others, from travel, at the table, even when worrying every day about trying to stay alive. Back in New York, I started college in the Bronx in Brooklyn and then took a road trip across the country to visit a friend for an adventure that fortuitously ended in Berkeley, California. My friend lived in a house of women, art student women to be exact, the best influence a human can have. Needless to say, I got myself into Berkeley and was invited to live in that house. I asked all my roommates where I should work and they all said, number one choice, Chez Panisse. Alice Waters, mother of Farm the Table, and, and, the, and the lead of the sustainable revolution that we, we're still talking about today. I got lucky. I lived with artists, worked at Chez Panisse. That became my fraternity, my sorority, your choice. Where do I start? The woman woke me up. Suddenly, Louisiana's insanity made sense. Movies became films. Mexico wasn't a foreign country, it was a culture. It was time to listen. French food, the birth of California cuisine, I was in the middle of it and knew it was time to pay attention, even when I wasn't. Learning how food and recipes have a myriad stories of where they come from was truly an epiphany. It suddenly meant something to me. Alice Waters, founder of Chez Panisse, noticed that I had restaurant in me and pulled me aside one day, total non sequitur, and said, you have to remember that you're unique. You have a unique voice to embrace. You're Cuban and you have a Basque background. And that was it. She literally stopped me in the hall, said that to me and kept walking. But I've never forgotten it. Her words inspired me to take the summer off and travel to the south of France into Spain's Basque country. Um, there, I saw and learned what Chez Panisse was about and drive from. And that was my aha moment there. This, this is my Europe trip. It's actually the cover of my first album. But, you know, obviously I was like deeply into New Wave. Um, suddenly in San Sebastian, uh, Spain, a storied Basque town, the funny thing was that I felt right at home. It was summer and where every day was a different saint's day. Each town had their saints. And the streets were full of people bar hopping from one tapas bar to another. I said, no wonder I gravitated to the bar business. It was in my blood. The tapas or pinchos tradition of small bites all presented on platters across the bar. Eat whatever you looks interesting, along with short sips of wine was laid in front of the bar patrons. Your bill was an honor system. The bartender asks you what your bill is. And I said to myself, geez, I love these people. Um, next. I visited the town of Guernica, the very same town Picasso depicted in the painting of a farmer's market and a sacred oak tree being bombed by German and Italian Air Force bombers at the request of Spanish nationalist Francisco Franco. Franco asked foreigners to cross into Spanish airspace and bomb Spanish people. One of the most horrifying moments in history. The painting, Guernica, had hung in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where I grew up, and I had visited it several times. So going to Guernica to pay respects is almost a Basque rite of passage. A pilgrimage, really. A horrible injustice to a peaceful and proud people. Still me. Um, my wanderings through these villages revealed even more, even more. Every town had several walls painted to play pelota, a precursor to highlight. Uh, do you know what highlight is? It's a wall, big basket. 
fastest ball in sport, believe it or not. G guys die all the time on the court because the ball hits them in the head. Crazy. Um, Pelota was to these towns what stickball is to New York City. It was a gateway drug to baseball, but in those Basque towns, it was a gateway drug to high life. But nothing tied it all together for me more than Chocos. Chocos started as all male closed gastronomical societies. The domestic Basque kitchen was traditionally known as a female bastion. And the Chocos evolved from other male sports clubs. Most Chocos usually ranging from 80 to 100 members are dedicated solely to food, dining, and politics is off limits. These Basque gourmands were safe, keeping safe during Franco's fascist nationalist regime. Safe spaces where the Basque could preserve their language, their dishes, and culture in the face of persecution. It's estimated that 50,000 Basque men are members of these approximately 1,500 clubs. To this day, Chocos have evolved, and today they have integrated women. Smart move. The societies serve as a place to do something fundamental to Basque culture, which is share. Boom. Uh, back in Berkeley, my artistic sorority roommates, and that's only half of them, uh, were developing a documentary to shoot in Mexico. The piece was about Mexican holiday, Day of the Dead. I was oblivious, but not for long. The trip was full of Day of the Dead traditions. Much of them are known now. This is, I'm afraid to even tell you, 40 years ago. Um, you know, the marigolds, the calaveras, the decorated skulls and skeletons, the gravesite shrines, and the food. Starting with Oaxaca's Day of the Dead markets, packed with crafts, culinary ingredients, prepared food from cocktail de mariscos, seafood cocktail, uh, to pulque, fermented maguey, agave, uh, Oaxacan mole in Oaxaca, that was amazing, uh, and fresh tortillas de maíz, corn tortillas, but made, you know, that morning, ground that morning, by hand that day, incredible stuff, it tastes so great. Everything spoke to the region's culture, craftsmanship and cuisine. Again, while discovering other cultures, I was reminded of my own ethnicity to learn it and embrace it. We filmed in a tiny village named Teotitlan del Valle, where the folk spoke almost no Spanish, only in an Indian dialect called Zapotec. We visited a family who welcomed us with open arms into their impeccable thatched roof, dirt floor, might have, might have been the cleanest floor I've ever seen in my life. These people had pride. Um, and we, they were stewing chicken for tacos. And for some reason, I was given the prized portion, which was the chicken feet. And it reminded me of Louisiana subcultures. After all, these are guys who eat alligator and squirrel. I'll take the chicken feet, thank you. Traveling became a mirror that reflected back onto me to discover more about my own culture, and it always came back to food. Unbeknownst to me, restaurants and food were becoming my calling. The table was set. Graduating from Berkeley and Chez Panisse, I now consider Chez Panisse my true alma mater. My education had evolved. To learn food had a lot to teach me. I started a graduate program at Tisch School for the Arts in, at, at NYU. Excuse me. At NYU uh, for, um, as a set designer. Here, theater spoke to cultures from around the world, and visual inspiration came from the streets of New York and the museums of New York. And I worked in restaurants, both French and French-inspired, and learned that there was culture in that as well. The vocabulary was bistro, a, for, a format that blends culture, community, the home's kitchen, and dining room. It felt right to me. The hospitality business was letting me investigate my interests, and they all spoke to me in restaurant vernacular. Design, camaraderie with colleagues and guests, cuisine, cocktails, wine, and culture. It all came together for me in restaurants, so it seemed like the way to go. In New York City, an opportunity presented itself for me to throw my hat into the ring of the Manhattan Restaurant Cauldron. Looking back, I really had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And that to all the students here, it's just like, keep that in mind. Just always just, as the Irish say, throw your hat over the fence. You, then you gotta go over the fence and they get it. 
and it's, it, you, you'll learn and it's, it's the way to live life, in my opinion. Sorry, parents. Um, my partner was an American chef, so I went with that, what I was comfortable with, but I went with the bistro format. Food rooted in American continental, and I opened a restaurant called Alva. Uh, and it's called Alva after Thomas Alva Edison, because I, once again, I over, overthink things all the time. And it was, um, he was an American inventor, and our food was inventive American. Um, I designed every damn thing in this place. And as a bartender of 17 years, I gave bar special consideration, now keeping the Basque Chocos and Tapas bars in mind. This was in time when smoking was still allowed in restaurants, and I decided I wanted to make the bar a smoking bar, a Cuban cigar bar, and consider the bar menu. There was only one item I insisted upon, which was in this American restaurant was a Cuban sandwich, or media noche. Same sandwich, different bread. They were pre-made, wrapped in the bar fridge, right next to the avarino. When ordered, they were popped into the sandwich press right behind the bar, those cigars and sandwich got me a lot of press, and I was finding my voice as a Cuban immigrant, as a restaurateur, and we got one star from the New York Times. Go figure. Soon, it was time, oh, oh we should have been there all along. That's, that's the front window of Alva, and now we're going there. Soon it was time to go it alone and try my hand at my sophomore effort. I found a derelict town house in the West Village of New York, Thought I knew just what I wanted to do with it. Restaurant on the bottom two floors and live on top with my pregnant Texan wife. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, I got married. And my baby girl, she was pregnant with my son. The time, uh, this time the concept would be autobiographical. Cuban, Mexican, Louisiana Cajun, and even a dash of Texan. An amalgam I called Gulf Rim, going around the horn. Even without the apartment, part of the project. The project was three times the size of Alva. I knew what I wanted and how I wanted to do it. I called it El Rey, while critically acclaimed, another one-star review from the New York Times, and quite popular, it didn't have legs. But I embraced and defined who I was, a restaurateur, a culinary voice, and a Latin ex-American. I sold it and we closed after four years. There was no turning back. My now ex-wife had enough of New York City by January 2001. And pretty prescient if you think about 9-11 was right around the corner. Um, so I sold El Rey, it was heartbreaking. I headed to Austin, Texas and jumped right into it. Got involved in a local food festival called the Texas Hill Country Wine and Food Festival. And within nine months, I was the executive director of the festival. The 2002 and 2003 version. Getting up to speed, our team went to Aspen Wine Food Festival. I geared up with cowboy boots, hat, pearl snap, and jeans. I was ready. The founder of the festival was aghast. She didn't want me to appear, us to appear like yokels. And I was like, yokels? I didn't see it that way. I saw it as regional identity. I had learned that identity was something to embrace, not hide or be embarrassed about. They wanted to appear sophisticated, however, American new definitions of culinary regional identities were evolving. Funny thing was that suddenly I was fighting Texans for the definition of culinary and winemaking Texas, begging them not to embrace sophisticated trappings of the tablecloths and Burgundian and Bordeaux varietals. I mean, geez, Texas can be a triple digit heat for over half the growing season. How about some hot weather varietals? From Spain, maybe. Tempranillo, Granacha, that would work. By the way, now they're all over the state. And that was 20 years ago. On the ground, you're like, we have to be here for another, another 20 years for this, this lecture to end? Sorry. Um, on the ground, Texas culinary world was different, changing and cool, ready to redefine itself as itself. And embrace artisanal craft, embrace its Mexican influences, embrace its heat and craftsmanship. A new generation was questioning career or having hit a home run, were looking for a second career that had, met, had meaning to them, not unlike rethinking a career that has happened after the pandemic pause button was hit. I wanted to support the undercurrent of younger up and coming stakeholders. Call them hipsters if you like. 
while recognizing those craftsmen who have been doing their generation for generations and never looking for recognition or aware of any trends, just working like craftsmen showing up every day. In my second year at the festival, along with sponsor Severe Magazine, we created the Texas Craft Awards for local artisans across the state. The award was a stylized TWFF metal cattle brand. I thought that was pretty cool. It part of this, that, that award was really one of my proudest achievements of my whole career. Um, the, whole, the whole idea of uh, recognizing regional culinary culture and that I was spearheading that, it was the first time I was really just out there, you know, fighting the fight. Um, uh, I found that, that my culinary voice, both as an individual and as an influencer, speaking to where we are and where we are from was important. The award went to artisans from across the state, a female goat cheese maker, producer in uh, Hill Country of Texas, an El Paso family of chorizo makers, an Elgin barbecue pit master, and an Austin urban farm couple from their farm, Boggy Creek, who eventually become like godparents to me. First book, Our Latin Table. I had started writing about what I missed, and that was a family, New York's multiculturalism, and all the foods involved. Leaving the festival after two years, those thoughts had evolved into my first book, Our Latin Table. The book is a love letter to my family, our heritage, and how we stay in touch with each other and our culture through the table. It takes the reader through a year of my family's life. Everything from Holy Communions to, and we'll get to it, Cuban Thanksgiving. Creating a menu cookbook format was inspired by Alice Waters' first cookbook, the Chez menu cookbook. Our Latin table was Latino and Latino-inspired recipes from family, friends, and life, and celebrated events. It chronicles our family's culinary life with some Spanish food, a lot of Cuban food, and it was hit with a pretty big California stick and seasoned with all sorts of recipes we have all picked up along the way, all of us being my family. I had started understanding the telling of our story was actually my story. One of our Latin tables chapters was Cuban Thanksgiving, as I mentioned. The menu, a turkey, of course. That's the Thanksgiving part. But from there, we had a black bean soup, a quintessential Cuban dish. Uh, a big lesson was paying attention to what the kitchen was teaching me. The taste, the smells, the essence of Basque and Cuban culture. When I was a kid, my mom or my abuelita and grandmother were making black bean soup. It always started with the roasting of peppers on open flames and the sauteing of garlic and onions. And that smell is home to me. And that's this, the Spanish called sofrito. And this is our version of the French culinary building block, Trinity, called mirepoix, carrot, onion, and celery. Sofrito, the Spanish building block of every dish, is our own trinity. At the table, we would dress the black bean soup as if it were a salad with olive oil and red wine vinegar. Being Cuban, we also added a splash of Bacardi silver rum. Now that was Cuban. You don't knock it until you tried it. Well, from there, from that book, that chapter, I was invited to cook Thanksgiving dinner at the James Beard House. The living, living in Texas, I was invited to go home to New York to cook at this quintessential American meal through my family's Cuban lens, and it was a thrill. I was honored. One course, one course that day, Thanksgiving, was bacalao, an essential Basque ingredient, if not dish. Bacalao is salt cod and the same fish that the Basque chased around the Northern Atlantic. And potato, and it also had potato and garlic in the preparation. The French know it in their cuisine as uh, brandade de moreau. I bring this up because I got to New York City and needed a fair amount of salt cod. Still having a relationship in New York City restaurant scene, I reached out to an old friend, Chef Andy Nasser, uh, at Casa Mono, Spanish restaurant. If you ever go to New York, it's a great place and really comfortable place. Love it. Which is a short walk from the James Beard house. And I asked if they had any salt cod he could spare. And he obliged. I walked over from the James Beard house. Gonna find my space now. 
and took, I walked over to Casa Mono from the James Beard house, and there was an entire half cod, dried, salted, not packaged, not wrapped in deli paper, but a full side of salted fish, hard as a rock, and it was about that big. I'm sort of like, what do I do with this? I walk back to the Beard House, through the downtown streets of New York, over, with a, that fish over my shoulder, in a city that's not impressed or shocked by much, I got my share of looks. That evening, I got a call from my mom from, in Miami. My father's health had taken a turn for the worse from several illnesses, and he was dying. Understood, but never expected. All seven of us needed to head to Florida the day after Thanksgiving. We all head to Miami to say our goodbyes to our dad and to back up our mom. I still had Thanksgiving for 75 of my closest strangers to deliver. So I walked out onto West 12th Street in front of the James Beard House in the West Village of New York into late fall drizzle on the bruised sidewalk leaves, had a good cry, like I'm about to now, <laughs> took a deep breath and headed back into the house to prepare the meal. The menu of familiar, <laughs> excuse me, the menu of familiar family recipes gave me strength and inspiration. As each item had its particular taste, smell, and memory. The next day was Thanksgiving. Sorry, guys. I was thankful for my family, proud of who I was, spent the afternoon and evening sharing cultural, personal flavors and stories with our guests. In its own way, it was life-affirming experience, knowing that my father would be proud that I was the host chef on this most quintessential American holiday at the Beard House, a mecca of American cuisine, expressing my history of Cuban, Basque, and American food flavors and traditions. Get away from that slide. Back in Austin, I had been working on a children's vegetable gardens at my kids' elementary schools. I enjoyed working with children. Alice Waters' edible schoolyard project was my inspiration and touchstone. From there, I started to develop television programming to teach children strong eating habits and like the school gardens, show their food sources and how to prepare dishes. For the pilot program, I decided the show would be bilingual. We would use a good friend of ours, Urban Farm, Boggy Creek, the very same from the Craft Awards, in Austin's funky east side as a backdrop, and we would cook my grandmother's from Asturias, Caldo Gallego. I applied for a grant from the Texas Wine and Food Foundation and won the grant. We were in business. A three-day shoot went smoothly. Into post, we edited and dropped in Latinx music throughout and sent it out to Austin's public television station, KLRU. We named it Poppy's Kitchen, and they loved it. I had run a festival, written a book, and now produced a television program, all expressing my cultural self, and not just through food, but now with content. In 2013, I went home to Havana, Cuba with most of our extended family, but most importantly, my mom. Cuba had changed since the last time my family was there. With the collapse of the Soviet Union and subsequent divestment of the, of, in Cuba's economy, along with President Obama's loosening of the American travel commercial restrictions, the opening up of Cuba economy was being spearheaded by private restaurants in Cuban homes, at first humble and soon sophisticated, while still embracing tradition and working with ingredients of a burgeoning organic urban farm economy along with scavenged seafood. I say scavenged because in the Wild West, which is quality food procurement in Cuba, there is a lot of freelancing. Every restaurant in Havana has grilled octopus, pulpo, which is one of my favorites. They all have octopus because the reefs surrounding Havana are infested with them like rats. They also have lobster. So on any day in any restaurant in Havana, you're gonna see octopus and crustaceans. I went to Cuba with low culinary expectations and left charmed and satiated in every way. Seeing Cuba for the first time since I was one year old and seeing it all through my mother's eyes induced tears all around. 
The stories I heard as a child were now all coming to life. My parents' house, my grandfather's house, their clubs, their favorite restaurants and neighborhoods. As a restaurateur, the restaurants truly impressed me. They're paying attention to what international tourists were demanding and on the plate and in hospitality. At the end of the trip, I had already decided I was coming back alone to write a book. Part travelogue, part travel guide, and with some family anecdotes. I wanted the reader to really see Cuba through my eyes, and all the photography in the book was mine. I was so excited to share this Cuba with the world from my grandfather's Basque club, Centro Vasco, the hearth of the Basque Cuban diaspora, along with all the Cuban Basque highlight players. It was a big game in Cuba, big gambling in Cuba, and that game was gambled on a lot. Actually, a kind of Basque fraternity, to be honest. To the, I also enjoyed seeing all the decrepit, amazing neighborhoods my family called home, and of course, the burgeoning entrepreneurial restaurant scene supporting so many of the beautiful Cuban people. I wanted to play my part in sharing Cuba with the world. The project had started with Obama-era direct flights from the U.S., cruise ships returning to the Key of the Antilles, as depicted in the Cuban coat of arms, and even the Rolling Stones performing a free concert to what seemed to be half of Havana's population. With the book coming out, boom, am I there yet? I think I'm, yes, food procurement. I see the guy in the middle there with all those fish, you know, he just went out and fished, and now he's going to restaurant kitchen door to restaurant kitchen door and selling them all, and that's one of the only ways they could make any money. There was no, no other way to make a, a penny. And it was allowed for a while, and every time they succeeded, it got better and better, the government just kept pulling it back. You know, so it was, it was not a great situation, and these guys really kicked it out of the park. Kicked it out of the park? Hit it out of the park? Baseball? With the book coming out, I reached out to the James Beard House and was invited to join a kitchen for a dinner being organized for a new Cuban cultural initiative at the Florida International University named Casa Cuba with two other Cuban chefs. The meal was in April 2019 and was sold out. It was a great celebration of the Cuban palate and its place on the American culinary, in the American culinary pantheon. I had also been asked to guide tours of Havana by cruise ship companies. But when the book came out in the spring of 2019, the current president at the time had imposed draconian rules to once again isolate Cuba. By spring 2020, COVID, the COVID pandemic occurred, had made all travel impossible, and my hope to share my Cuba was put on ice. More recently, we have all been through COVID's har harrowing time. The pandemic shuttered us all in our homes. To my distress, restaurants across the nation closed. COVID's disruption had hit home and forcibly separated us all. It always felt that we humans are social. I've always felt that we humans are social in our families, our communities, and in my case, our restaurants. Soon everyone was reaching out to one another for the shared experience whether it was bread baking, binge watching, Zoom business or holiday reunions. Fortuitously, FIU's Casa Cuba reached out to me to produce a segment on Cuban cooking for their pandemic channel, La Ventanita. Two things, Cubans in Miami have shops, restaurants, and cafes where you can pick up what's called a Cuban coffee or a cafecito on the fly. It, they, you literally walk up to the window. As I said earlier, they, that, you know, it was like a social scene with everything, like everything for Cubans is. And the way you make a cafecito, I know you, that's what's all on all your minds, is you make a double espresso and you put as much sugar in it as you can until it becomes paste. Then you make another double espresso and you sweeten it normally. Then you take a chunk of that paste and throw it in there. And that is Cuban rocket fuel. Uh, these windows are almost always walk up and encourage loitering, alas, instant community. I asked Casa Cuba's director how many segments they were planning and who was on board. Her answer, eight to 10, and I was her first call. And I said, I'll do them all. She agreed, and my quarantine suddenly had a challenge, a schedule, and a community. It worked for me. Ted Lasso, how'd that get in there? 
Did anybody here watch Ted Lasso? There we go, there's one. <laughs> this joke's not gonna go over very well. <laughs> uh, I do, I'm not a series guy, nor have I ever binged a series, unless of course you include Queen's Gambit. But I love Ted Lasso, it's really, a, I do recommend it. It's a beautiful, beautiful series. Uh, for its sincerity, its humanity, its humor. In the second season, the holiday episode, spoiler alert, Higgins, that's the guy on the left there, the team's director of communication, opens up his home on Christmas to players who are celebrating away from their families, and the team is completely international. Another beautiful thing about the show. In this scene, each player arrived with food from their home countries. A culinary United Nations, Higgin toasts the group. I know you'd have preferred to be home with family, but it was truly an honor to have you with us to share our traditions, help make a few new ones, and to the family we're born with, the family we make along the way, and most importantly, to Richmond. That's the soccer team that the whole show is about, right? Whoever, <laughs> thank you. Um, over food, they depict how we are all the same at the same table. We can all show grace by understanding our common ground and the common voice of our culinary culture. To end, I'll paraphrase a great lover of all things Basque and Cuban, life, culture, and cuisine, and that's Ernest Hemingway. In the Spanish kitchen, table, and bar, I learned that food and hospitality is our movable feast. And when you learn and appreciate your own culture, you can find tolerance, understanding, and love for all other cultures. In a pot, a wok, a bamboo steamer, a tagine, a paella pan, a crepe pan, a mocajete, or on the plate. Thank you, but I wanna read two quotes for you as well. They're, they start my, my, this book. One's from James Beard, the guy who, start, who the foundation was started in his home in New York after he passed away. Uh, food is our common ground, a universal experience, which I totally agree. And the other one is from Anthony Bourdain. Across the ocean, <laughs> I'm getting emotional again, I apologize. Across the ocean or simply across the river, walk in somebody else's shoes or at least eat their food. It's a plus for everybody. Thank you. Now it's time for the question and answer session. Because this event is being recorded, please wait until the microphone reaches you to ask your question. We will now take the first question. <laughs> so from, from, from Lucas' class, I will now use my punchline. Now you all know, know the joke. Bueller? Bueller? It's the first time I got to laugh. And I know that was charity. Now this is typical me. I, I asked Sarah. Oh, by the way, I also want to thank... Um, Sarah and Jen, Jen from the farm and Sarah from um, uh, the, uh, the Clark Forum, uh, who they've been, I've been in communication with them for like two months and they've just been genius, you know, so incredible. I'm very, very lucky to be able to work with such uh, efficient, effective, and good people. Uh, but anyway, I asked Sarah, I go, Sarah, you know, can I just have a bottle of plastic water on the podium? She goes, I think they provide a pitcher and a glass. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. And then she showed up with this. And I've been using it the whole, during this whole thing, and then right now, I was thirsty, and I'm like, okay, well, that's a grab. <laughs> Could have done that the whole time. Anyway, I, I digress. Uh, am I supposed to, like, find people? Oh, go for it. Hello. So um, my question is, what is your personal favorite Cuban dish? That's a tough one. I mean, to make it specifically Cuban, It's a tough one. I keep on, land, running on landing on Basque things. Um, but it's probably something like, I mean, black bean soup, uh, because I, in that section that I talked about it, it's just like, it's just so emotional for me because of the smells and growing up with that. And whenever that started in the kitchen, I'm home. And then it's funny because I, I have two children and my son is the, the better cook and, um, and loves it. And I remember the whole time when I was bringing in 
I'm sorry, they were brought up in Austin, Texas. And whenever we would cook, like for Thanksgiving, I would do Cuban things. And I always thought like, you know, will they ever, will this ever matter to them? You know, here we are in the middle of Texas and, and their mother's American, why, why should it matter? And uh, lo and behold, you know, it's one of those things where you just gotta be patient. And, and, and the, uh, the, the uh, roots take root. And uh, so I'd say black bean soup because of, and not necessarily for its cuisine aspect, although I love it, um, but for its emotional aspect. Well, good night, everybody. No, I'm joking. Um, did you ever have an identity crisis, or not identity crisis per se, but did you ever struggle to fully balance being Basque and Cuban and American as well as white passing? And how were you able to express that through your food, find the balance, you know, with all those identities? You know, I, mean, I think this talk was kind of about that because, you know, starting with the uh, hamburger helper <laughs> and the cute black bean soup. It, and, it, and then I, got, I really, at one point in my career, was essentially when it came to food, I was a Francophile. It's like everything was French to me. Um, and then it just, it just the, the Latino part just crept into me, and I just started focusing on that instead. And once again, since I represent white, I never get, I'm, I just never get uh, asked about my ethnicity. So it really was a process that took a long time because I never had any outside feedback in it. So it was something that I was able to develop within myself at my own pace to answer your question. Um, but I never had an identity crisis other than when I first got up here today. Uh, no, uh, it, once again, it, it's, it's that represent white thing, you know, and white privilege, just like every door is always open to me. I've never been afraid to walk through a doorway in my life. Uh, and I find that as an unbelievable luxury. Um, and, but I've worked with every ethnicity in the world in the restaurants and I've always, you know, done everybody right. You know, I've, I've just the way I, I am and I evolved that way. It wasn't even something that I consciously made a, decide, a decision to do. I just love people and I love all people. You know, as I said, you, know, you can find uh, beauty and love and culture in all, in all foods worldwide. You know, and that, there's a story that I didn't, I think I told in the class, I might have told the story. But, um, and it's interesting because it ties together the American South, um, slavery, uh, um, colonialism, which is, uh, believe it or not, the humble okra. And okra is from Africa. And uh, they say it came across the ocean with slaves, and um, just in seeds. And we had, when I got to Cuba, I was totally surprised at like almost every restaurant, the side dish was okra. And I'd been brainwashed, call it whitewashed if you want, that that was a Southern American thing. And of course, Southern Americans, white Southern Americans embrace it as theirs, but it's not theirs. It's low country food, and it comes from slavery, and in Africa, uh, the word for okra is kimbombo. And funny, you know, we call it okra, but in Cuba, it's, they don't have a Spanish word for it. They call it kimbombo. And then in Louisiana, they use okra as a thickener to make gumbo. And the word gumbo is derived from the word kimbombo. So, you know, it all, makes sense to me as I slowly learned, you know, that. And then, then I, I sort of feel connected to all of it, you know? Um, I love low country food, you know? And, but then I love the Creole influence in Cuba. Did I even remotely answer that question? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Those are empanadas.
I, you know, the, the trying to stay healthy part of me, <laughs> I don't deep fry them, but I love them deep fried, so I bake them. And then the, the part of me that still has residue from Hamburger Helper, <laughs> I make them with Pillsbury dough. <laughs> the, um, but I have a bunch of recipes that I've just sort of like, I just put together. It, it's unlike, I, I always say I'm not a chef, I'm a sandwich maker. And like all those things are just like a pizza, an empanada, a sandwich. It's just, you know, give me some starch and let me, let me throw some flavors at it. So that's what I do with empanadas. Those are ones that I'm, we're heading right into the season, and I'll probably make some next week in my, with my mom, which are, those are uh, butternut squash and chorizo with um, um, oregano and uh, cumin. And as a matter of fact, Jen, we're making um, that same uh, combination as tarts for the gather dinner. Um, the answer, yeah, that, that answered the question. Yes, or yes, yes. Is that me? Hi, uh, hi, Fernando. How are you? Uh, thank you for for your talk. It was it was wonderful. And uh, one of the things that I really appreciate is that you reminded us that food is, of course, much more. Well, food is always political, and it's much more than just fuel, right? It's always about history and culture and identity and memory. And, af and af affect on a lot of things, a whole conglomerate of things, um, really. So my, my question is, what was the first dish or culinary experience or cuisine that started um, to make you think about the fact that food is all of these things? To tell you the truth, it was probably uh, Chez Panisse with Alice Waters. I mean, I walked in there and I was just knucklehead. And then I was there for four years. And, dear, and she, in, she was very much about the region, California, Northern California, but at the same time, she was a Francophile as well. And so I learned all this stuff about, and for the words worth, my girlfriend at the time was, was a French major. And so just like, that's when all of a sudden I started taking it seriously. Yeah, definitely. You had briefly touched on how when you were the semen wiper uh, that you <laughs> were derided a bit from the crew. Did that type of experience happen often and how did that, how did you express that in you your mean, culinary uh, work? I didn't express <laughs> my being pissed off in my food, but uh, you know, it's funny, just last night I walked into a bar for dinner and um, I have my New York Yankees cap because the Yankees played the Red Sox last night. See, I got it in there. Leon told me, I told you I would. Um, and uh, the moment I walked in, some, the guy turned his head and he's like, and I go, I know, Yankees, sorry. And I just kept walking. So it was not, it's no more than that. But at the time, I was, you know, like 17 and a half years old. So, you know, I wasn't a grown man. And I was suddenly in the middle of the ocean with a bunch of absolute maniacs. So anything like that, you know, I was on edge the whole time. It was, like I, like I, I hope I expressed, it was a horrible time. Um, I did not make much money, um, uh, but it was, that was a real life-forming thing. And especially the whole idea, and this is another, like, you know, advice to the kids, and I'm sorry to say that, kids, is what it taught me was, I mean, I just literally stepped out of this world in New York and stepped into that world just because I made a decision. And, and it had its highs and lows, like I hope I depicted, but that's all it takes. It's like walk through the doorway, just go do it, you know? So, um, yeah, it, and the, it, that was like, that was my introduction and the truth is, you know, you're really trying so hard just not to get killed that you're not really thinking emotionally anymore. <laughs> you're just trying to survive. But it was a great experience. And then, um, oh, I can't remember your name, the orange shirt, right up there. Yes, you. Hey, he is interested in going to Louisiana. And Louisiana is, my, I go to Louisiana, uh, to New Orleans twice a year. I have tons of great friends. It's really as important a cuisine to me as any. Yeah, I love it so much. French influence, of course. 
uh, Portuguese interest, uh, influence, Spanish influence, um, and um, Creole, of course. It's, uh, it's a great place. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, actually, I've been told to ask the next question. Um, uh, to your right up here. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you have a, quite a positive relationship with your cultural identity. Uh, what factors in your development would you attribute to that status? Could you repeat that? Sorry. Sorry. I don't mind if you take your mask off for a second, if it's just so I can hear you or talk through it or whatever. Go ahead. Uh, you have quite a positive relationship with your cultural identity. What factors in your development would you attribute to that status? You know, it's a weird thing, and, and part of it is this, believe it or not, is this um, representing white thing and not having doors closed on me, is that we just, as I grew, it's like I sort of understood America as this white world, and, and I had this confidence. So I never, never occurred to me to not be confident. So it's, it's not like I developed confidence, it's just I never developed not being confident. Um, really, you know, and I, once again, as I said earlier, I think I'm a lucky son of a bitch and I, you know, was privileged, you know, so I got, I got, I'm really, really lucky. I got both, you know, I got to, you know, swim in this country's culture anytime I wanted to, however I wanted to go into the water as deep as I wanted to without being afraid. But meanwhile, slowly but surely realized that I was different and, and to learn to appreciate that and that was cool for me. So what fence will you throw your hat over next? I'm actually developing something called Farm to Business and basically teaches um, corporate culture through uh, the um, concepts of the farm to table arc. You know, and it's, you know, it's like um, the sustainability of the farm the respect of your coworkers in the kitchen, and then emphasizing uh, socializing over social media at the table. Uh, and the idea is basically to bring in uh, corporate teams because they pay top dollar, uh, and teach them. And it's basically a full like um, twelve hour day, uh, or if they want to do it in two days, it's twenty four hours. And that's that's really the next thing. Although I always have a bunch of little projects as well. Two more questions. Uh, following up on the last question, um, it, may, it reminded me of you just earlier in the talk, talking about your trip to San Sebastian in 1983. Actually, this is pretty funny, Asun and I were in San Sebastian, the summer of 83, spent an awful lot of time in those bars you were talking about. We probably coincided. Um, but what, for me, apart from just the amazing food, what you briefly describe those environments of just all those people together, the honor system of you telling the bartender what you had consumed, et cetera, that impressed me maybe even more than the food itself, the kind of the easy social, social, sociability that could be created so quickly over food. And so I'm wondering if, if, if the, the, my question really had to, has two parts. Did, did, was your experience similar? And is there a relation between that and this current project of? My, my experience was absolutely similar. Um, and I, I just loved it, you know. And once again, like every town, you know, as I said, had their Saints Day and had their festivals. And the, and every night, people were bar hopping. And I th I'm like, this is the way to do it. Um, and just, and, and everybody was, you know, in a good mood. Everybody was laughing and smiling. And, you know, it wasn't like, you know, you, you can walk into some bars in some places, with, you know, like working class bars, and you get looked down upon, or, you know, you can all of a sudden get into a fight. Like, none of that really even, like, occurred. And, um, and the same thing with elite places. 
it was just every, it was very democratic in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I love that. Uh, you know, obviously the product was great. In this, um, I think there is an aspect to it. I hadn't thought of it until you asked the question for farm to business. Um, how, and that's sort of like what I was saying about socializing over social media at, at the table. It was just like people, I think the big thing is that people can learn to listen, especially in the corporate uh, environment and respect each other, um, we would have better, uh, better lives and better careers. People would be, you know, just treated well. It's a big step that's happened through COVID as well in the restaurant business where just so many people are like, why do I have to devote my whole life to this when I'm treated poorly, paid poorly, and, and I'm here 12 hours a day? Um, and they're right. And it's funny, because the Chez Panisse, 30 years ago or more, they started an hourly wage, no tips. I remember when that, when that happened, I mean, it made no sense to me at all at the time. Um, but it, you know, that restaurant, there's probably more cooks than there were people on the floor. I mean, I remember the first, the first time I walked into like dessert station, there was a person whose job was to peel the grapes. And like all day long, they're just like peel, hand peeling grape at a time. And I was like, <laughs> the whole thing was mind blowing to me. But it kind of makes sense that you know, she comes from the cook's point of view and she was like, no, we're all gonna make the same amount of money. You know, in a way, very communal. Um, and it worked, you know, I got paid the same as, it. and it also, it, it also creates an equity that then everybody treats each, each other better, you know? There, yeah, so I think so. Hope so. And I'll, now that you set it up, I'll, I'll keep it in mind. Yes? Yeah, um, so I'm from New Mexico. Um, I was just wondering what and uh, what experiences, if any, have you had with like New Mexican food? And do you have any stories of these experiences? What are you doing tonight? <laughs> uh, I, New Mexico is right over the border from um, Texas. Through my, when I went to Northern California, I would ski in Lake, Lake Tahoe. Um, and uh, right across the border in, off the panhandle of Texas is um, Taos. Oh, I know Taos pretty well. I've been to Taos like, I don't know, 10 times. Yeah, I ski there, but I go there you know, all the time. I, it's a, it's, if anybody has a chance to go there, it's just magical. And, um, and also great cuisine. There's a place there run by a woman. The name has something to do with heart. And it was a little white church, and she changed it over to a restaurant. And at the big family table was literally the altar from the church. Uh, super cool place. Christmas there, what, uh, what do they call them? I'm forgetting the, uh, the bags or the candles. Thank you. Luminaries. So the whole town and across, and they all have, uh, you know, a lot of that Pueblo architecture, so it's flat top, right? And um, are just lined with bags and candles in them. All of the uh, walkways up into homes, into businesses, all the sidewalks, all the street. So the, at nighttime, and it's snow on the ground, it's cold, it's just, so romantic and so beautiful. You know, I know I've, I've driven th all the way across the state several times. There's a, uh, I think it's New Mexico, a, a very good winemaker, um, Gruet. And, uh, and they're in, uh, what's the name, or close to, name of the big cities, two big cities in New Mexico? Albuquerque, Albuquerque I think. What's the other one? No, Albuquerque. Um, there's actually a place called uh, Los Something uh, that I've, I follow on Instagram, and it's just the most beautiful, like, ranch. And they have, an, they have their own farm, they have a restaurant. I'm like, I'm thinking like, you know what? <laughs> I'll, I'll retire there, I'll just go work there. I'll work for them. It's just gorgeous, lavender fields, just beautiful. And then when it comes to food, and this is gonna be like a dumb, obvious answer, but um, I'm totally in love with hatch peppers. Yeah, and when they come out, you know. So I love, love, love New Mexico. Yeah, I miss it. I haven't been in a while. I have to go do a trip. I've also, like, I'm, I've taken my kids, like, to Los Angeles from Austin. Like, I love road trips I'm in the car. 
I took my mom, one Christmas, I remember my family, I asked my mom in the fall, my mom, for Christmas, come to Austin, and I'll drive you to the Grand Canyon. And she's like, okay. And but my mom was a painter, and she'd been all over the country, all over Europe, Cuban, of course, and, but she had never been to the Southwest. And she, um, George O'Keefe, as a painter, she loved George O'Keefe. I'm like, you should see this. You should see what inspired her, because it really is unique. And um, that's what I was telling you on the way over here. When she was walking me over, I was telling her this whole story. Um, I remember my brothers and sisters were talking to each other about me, and they're like, what the hell is Fernando doing? <laughs> What's he doing taking mom on a road trip? And we went from uh, Austin to Marfa, Marfa to Santa Fe, Santa Fe to Taos, Taos to, uh, oops, sorry, Taos to uh, Grand Canyon, blew her mind, blows everybody's mind. And then from there to Santa Fe, and then we spent like, that's the only time we spent more than one night in one place. We went back to Santa Fe and stayed like two nights. And then from there to Austin. And it was great. I can't remember, you remember what the question was. But anyway, oh, it's still part of your question. Yeah, so, and, it, and going through it, you know, my, my share of New Mexico, I, I love New Mexico, big time. This concludes tonight's presentation. Please join me in thanking Fernando Sanelegui. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>